Okay. Um, I guess we should get started, even though uh, there aren't many of us here today. Um, okay, yes, it's time to start the, the meta theory part of the course. And I think that I have a plan that will keep everyone happy. Um, we're going to... Um, we're going to attempt to, to do measure theory um, talking about integrals and about measures sort of at the same time. Um, that I hope, and I, and I think actually that the extra stuff that I want to say now about integrals, which wasn't in the previous parts of the course, are actually going to save <coughs> us almost exactly the same amount of time later in the course when we do spectral theory. We'll really just be able to uh, yeah, I think, it's, I think it's actually going to work out nicely. And uh, this is, in fact, we're in some sense doing the same material that we, I did last time. It's just an integral. Okay, so uh, uh, let's uh, begin just by talking about Lebesgue measure for a little bit. And I just want to, we just want to think of formally what, what integration means. So, uh, if we have uh, some function that is continuous, compactly supported on the real line or, or on our end, uh, we can integrate it. So, we can think about the function that sends f to the integral of f of x dx. Okay? Now, uh, this quantity here. Uh, it's certainly finite. F isn't there. Why is that? F has got some supremum because it, 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 it essentially just on some compact set. The compact set that we recorded <coughs> on, in particular, is sitting inside some closed interval. So that compact set has some upper bound on its volume because this is just less than uh, the supremum of F of x. Uh, which, which is finite because we're on some compact set, times the volume of the support of f. Okay, so uh, so we have a linear function. Yeah, so let me. So that's uh, compactly supported. Uh, and the big C is. Because so we've got this linear functional 
uh, which we'll just write as an integration symbol, but uh, now it's a symbol like psi or f or anything like that. It's just some function here. Okay, so uh, we want to learn a little bit more about what this what this integral does. So the first obvious question. Uh, so this thing isn't a Hilbert space, but it is a norm space. It's a Freeman norm. Uh, so, so certainly we can ask, is it bounded? Okay. We can just ask, is the absolute value of the number we get here uh, bounded by some multiple of the, the norm over here? That's a yes or no. <coughs> What's that? Yes. Uh, no, so sadly it's not. So the integration is, is not bounded when we work here. Um, why is that? Well, say I, say I consider some functions um, Fn, which are defined. Like this, so they're just constantly equal to one for a big chunk in the in the middle, and then they pretty quickly drop down to zero outside of that interval. So these guys are certainly continuous. Uh, we could even just use a straight line interpolation between n and n plus one. Yeah, uh, they're certainly compactly supported, but they all have norm one. Okay, so the supremum norm of fn is 1, but the integral of fn, when we apply this integration operator, well, that's, uh, that's greater than 2 n. Okay? So we've got some things all in the unit ball, according to the norm on this guy, being sent to bigger and bigger and bigger things. So there's no bound on, on this integration function. Uh, but we could say, uh, if we restrict uh, to some compact set, Uh, and maybe, uh, yeah, but in R. Then uh, we can think of integration as a map from, well, there's no need to say uh, compactly supported anymore because we're just going to look at functions that we find on, on A. Uh, so this is bounded. Can someone, can someone think how to prove? So it's bounded? Do it, even. Yeah. Well, it should be bounded by uh, the, the, the freedom norm because the, the volume of A. Great, yeah. So this is this is controlled by just how big F gets times the volume of A. And the point is that this is certainly finite because we're looking at a compact set in R or Rn or whatever, and compact sets sit inside uh, uh, some closed ball. Volume is bounded by that, that ball it is. Okay. So, okay, so in general, in the, most of the situations we really care about, though, doing integration on R or Rn or something like that, our integration function is not going to be a bounded linear functional. It's going to be an unbounded linear functional. Okay, but that's okay. What else can we say about it? If I just gave you some linear functional from here to here, uh, can you think of something you might <coughs> notice about it that would convince you that we weren't just talking about integration or something that looked like integration? What, what am I trying to get at? Um, let's see. Um, well, okay. maybe it's, it's hard to give you a clue what I'm trying to get at. Um, if f is positive, integral f is positive. Okay. So this integral guy is a positive uh, linear function. So here, I mean, we're, we're sort of relying on the fact that we know what it means to be positive here, just that it's a function whose values are positive, and we know what it means to be positive here. In general, if you just have some norm space in general, it's a bit harder to say what the positive elements in it are. But we'll get, we'll, we'll get to that much later in the course. These are sort of nice general notions. 
well, I guess for Banach algebras, whatever they are. Okay. But in any case, this thing takes positive functions to positive numbers. Okay, so let's just make a crazy ridiculous generalization. So <coughs> find a, uh, a Rajon integral uh, as uh, just any positive linear functional Always call integral uh, from compactly supported functions on some x to R, where x is some. And now I'm a little bit indecisive, and I reserve the right to change the adjectives here depending on how things go and how easy I want to make the proofs as we go on. But the theory uh, can be set up if we work hard enough, where x is just some locally compact. Hausdorff space. Uh, okay, so um, let's postpone what those adjectives mean for a moment. Maybe we can come back and discuss them in a moment. But basically, the idea of like what do we mean by an integral? Well, it's just some gadget that for every compactly supported function on our space spits out a number. It's integral. Uh, with the <coughs> property that it's, that it's a positive linear function, or it takes positive functions to positive numbers. Okay. So, the amazing theorem, which we may or may not prove, depending on how things go, but we'll at least aim towards proving, is just that uh, this, is, this is the subject of measure theory, uh, and secretly, uh, well, yeah. So let me just state the let me just state the theorem or the, the goal. Um, there is the bijective correspondence uh, between radon measures on X, uh, radon integrals on X. Got ahead of myself. Where we just mean linear functionals on the compactly supported functions. Take positive stuff to positive stuff. Uh, and uh, read on measures, so this is obviously stuff we're going to have to start defining, on the Borel sigma algebra. So this is kind of an amazing theorem. Uh, it's going to take us a little while to maybe understand its significance. So we're going to come back and talk a bit about sigma algebras and real sigma algebras and eventually, well, and then what measures are in sigma algebras and eventually what radon means. That, that one will take a little bit longer. But basically, ignoring radon, which is some sort of slight condition forcing things to be a bit nice, you should think that this set here we're talking about, we're saying just we've got some space x, we've got some sigma algebra of measurable sets on that space x, and we've got some measure on them. But actually what we're saying is that you can package up all of that information, the, what the sigma algebra is and what the measure is, in this integral, just this linear functional that all it knows how to do is take integrals of compactly supported continuous functions. So, uh, of course, we expect, given all this setup, that you can integrate lots of other things as well. You can certainly you expect you've got to integrate functions that aren't continuous, that are, that are pretty horrible. And so part of the way that this is going to work is that we're going to explain that actually, if you just know how this part works, then you can automatically define integrals of lots of other ghastly functions as well. But it's enough to, to know how, a, how integration works on these and everything else just sort of comes along for free. And uh, we're going to use that to great effect uh, a bit later in the course when we study spectral theory for arbitrary self-returned or arbitrary bounded self-returned operators, not necessarily compact ones, where we'll really use this idea that all you need to know is how to do integration on compactly supported continuous functions. And all of the associated paraphernalia of measure theory and integration of integrable functions sort of just, just automatically appears. Okay. Um, Okay, so we need to start explaining some of the words <laughs> in this side of the world uh, before we can even start uh, 
through the theory. Oh, and I mean, this, uh, maybe I should say there is a bijective correspondence. And for now, I'll just write dot, 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 but we've got to come back and fill in. I mean, it's a, it's a really explicit and pretty easy construction. Given an integral, here's how you produce the measure. Given a measure, here's how you produce the integral. And we're going to, we're going to give, the, give the exact recipe for, for doing all of that. OK. So uh, how much of these words down here should I bother talking about? How do people feel about Hausdorff? So can someone you know, tell me what Hausdorff means? Well, it's like my mouth is too late. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. So, so the yeah. If you if you take any two points, x and y. So, a given x, y, and x, we can find open sets u and v. So there exists u v open. And then what do we want? We want just like in this picture. Uh, oh yeah, and this joint, just like in the picture, <laughs> uh, with x in u and y in v. Okay, so it's telling you that any time you've got two points that oh, uh, we really should write x not equal y there, otherwise it's obviously impossible. So any time you've got two points that aren't the same point, you can sort of demonstrate that they're actually some distance apart by finding open sets that sort of show that they're they're apart. Okay, um, so before we get on to locally, do people want to tell me what compact means? Here we go, Kim. Okay, yeah. Uh, every cover has a finite subcover, that's one definition. Um, someone want to tell me what a cover is? So is it, do you know what a cover is? And it's a collection of open sets. Yep. That Great, yep, yep. That sounds great. And so being a, a finite subcover just means you can throw out all but finite <coughs> open sets and you still cover. Okay, so that's a good definition. What's another definition of compact? Someone else? So. Every sequence Yeah, so this is sequentially compact. Oh. What does that mean in other sections? Oh, yeah. Yeah, so. Oh. No, 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 no. So, what was the question? What does that mean now? In metric space, that makes sense, but in a no, so it's it yeah. still makes perfect sense here. So here, so this says every sequence has a convergent subsequence. So an arbitrary topological space. Yeah. So this makes this sentence makes perfect sense. So, um, so a sequence in an arbitrary topological space just means a sequence of points. Subsequence makes sense. So we, all we need to understand is what convergent means. So, so saying that uh, it's just in X, the topological space, uh, Xn converges to X means what? Yeah, yeah. Uh, for all open set containing X, Eventually, x n is an e. Yep. Are they equivalent? Are these are these two equivalent? Not, not necessarily. Yeah, unfortunately, they're not quite always yeah, equivalent. The we so we need one more thing. So so they're equivalent if does anyone know the horrible condition? If it's second countable. Yeah. Okay. Oh. If it's second countable. Uh, Let's not worry too much about the distinction beyond being aware that these can be different. And in non-second countable spaces, you can find things that, I think, does neither imply the other? Or? I think that's right. Yeah, you can find things that are compact but not sequentially compact. And you can find things that are sequentially compact but not compact. And that's horrible. Uh, the thing that is always true, always, is every net. As a convergent subnet, whatever those are. Let's not go into nets right now. Okay, um, okay. but let's just happily um, assume second countability for everything we ever do. That's fine. Okay, 
So yeah, so we have these two different versions of compactness as long as we're second countable. Uh, okay, so that was compact, but what does locally compact mean? Local processor or the compact. So that's a neighborhood that contains both. Yeah, so, so locally compact is saying that Let's read that in. Uh, X is locally compact uh, if, um, I guess we can say if every X in X has a compact neighborhood, I think that'll do it. So I guess you can find some set containing X that, so what, is, what does it mean to be a neighborhood, first of all? Yeah, so it's some set containing your guy X, and there's still room to fit an open set around X inside the neighborhood. And so we just want some compact neighborhood, so your point, some compact set surrounding the point, and an open set in between the point and the compact set. So like, that picture is I think, great. Every point X, we can find an open set around it, We may or may not ever get so far into the thickets we need to worry about the distinction between this stuff. Okay, certainly, I mean, certainly Rn satisfies this because you can just take k to be, um, well, you can, you can just take a ball, some radius, and turn it, take the, the closed ball around that. Um, but I guess Rn is not such a boring example. Very often we want to do integration theory on manifolds, which are just spaces that locally look like Rn. And of course, if you locally look like Rn, then of course you're locally compact, because every point has a little neighborhood that looks like a little neighborhood in Rn. So you can use compact, you can, you can use local compactness of Rn to get local compactness of any manifold. Okay, so that's a, it's a fairly, they're both fairly mild conditions. Okay, enough point set topology for a little bit. Um, let's now go through uh, understanding some of the words in this. So, um, so what's an algebra of sets to begin? I guess, so I mean, we have to explain what the Borel sigma algebra is, so to understand that we need to understand what, uh, um, what a sigma algebra is, and to understand that we need to, under we need to know what an algebra of sets is. So can someone start us off and say what an algebra of sets is? Or a Sometimes people might call this a Boolean algebra of sets to distinguish it from a sigma algebra. I can tell you what a sigma algebra is. Yeah, okay, so. I feel like something is, if it would, would, would be changed from that, <coughs> like, it's arbitrary to get finite. Yeah, yeah, so a, so a Boolean algebra. And if you want to, I mean, if you want to really disambiguate uh, from like the algebra in the sense of of like representation theory, like a vector space with a multiplication on it, you can write of sets uh, as well. Um, but in this subject, some people will even just say algebra uh, is uh, a collection curly B of subsets of X. So I mean, fixed some space X to do this in, such that. So if Achilles on the right track, that it's uh, like a sigma algebra just with finite stuff, what are the things we want to, what are the axioms we want to write here to it being a, an algebra? It's going to have the, yeah, the, the, all of x is going to be one of the sets, and the empty set's got to be there, yep. Yeah. What else? Well, I think countable is going to come later for, for when we talk about sigma algebras. For, for these Boolean algebras, we just want finite. So, yes, yeah, so we want the empty set in there. Um, if E is in B, we always want complements of sets in the algebra to be in there. And then if you've got two sets in there, then they're union is in there. Okay. And so that pretty easily tells you that sort of combining these two facts. Uh, actually, the intersection <coughs> is in there as well, uh, as well as the set difference, because this is just the intersection of E with its with the complement of F. Even 
the symmetric difference, the stuff that's in one or the other, but not both of ENF. Uh, and also, uh, by induction, uh, finite unions and intersections. You could, of course, put all of these can, things here in as extra conditions on being a Boolean algebra, because, of course, they're just always true. Um, I think the, the idea <coughs> is to put as few as possible so that if someone shows you a collection of sets and your job is to check that it's a Boolean algebra, you've got as few things as, as possible that you need to check. But you, you're welcome to use all these other facts as you go. Um, okay, so what does it mean to say uh, B is fine? So B here is some Boolean algebra is finer than B prime. Or, or, or B is coarser than B prime for the other direction. What do those things mean? B prime is a subset of B. Uh, set of, it's a set of sets. <coughs> yeah. Um, which way around does it go? It goes. It's a fine. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. Mitzvah yeah. means that. So. So this is this is saying that there are um, there are more <coughs> sets in the in the uh, collection B than there were in the collection B prime, which you can think of as there's ma we're making finer distinctions between the the the, the points somehow. Like <coughs> some we like uh, it, when you when you go away and do uh, probability theory, you start thinking of these algebras of sets as um, uh, you as describing um, sort of observations. You might say like, like the underlying set X could be like all the possible states the real underlying system, the, the real world could be in, which you maybe don't have direct access to because the real world is unclear whether it really exists or not. Uh, but then you've got some collection of, 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 of subsets of those states of the real world, which you think of as, as, as like events, like uh, one of these sets E might be um, a or a kangaroo on the back path on my way to work today. And that sort of divides up the states, all possible states of the world into two clumps, those states where I did see the kangaroo and those states where I didn't. And I think it, like, you should think here that um, here we're saying that sort of V has more possible observations about the world than V prime did. That's what the, the finer relation is. And of course, coarser means the opposite way around. Uh, so what's the, what's the finest Boolean algebra? So, so uh, I'll just write 2 to the x for the power set, like <coughs> functions from x to the two object set, telling you whether an element is in or out, so is the, is the finest algebra, and then the coarsest, of course, is empty on the whole thing. Yeah, the empty on the whole thing, yeah. Because you have to have the whole thing to close out the combination, is the coarsest. Great. Okay. So, um, before, I just want to say a few more things about algebras before we get on to sigma algebras. I think it's sometimes easier to just keep things separated. Um, if F is any collection of subsets, uh, maybe we can write it like this. This is meant to be the Boolean algebra generated by F. What's that meant to? Well, to can you guess what this is meant to be? The coarsest algebra containing F. Yeah. So you've got to be a little bit careful when you see, when you define it by saying it's the coarsest algebra containing everything in F. Are you sure that there is such a coarsest algebra? There might be two different algebras that are incomparable that both contain both contain F. Yeah, take the intersection of all. Yeah, so so good yeah. So the usual thing here is is the is the intersection uh, of all Boolean algebras uh, containing F. Uh, even there you've got to be a little bit careful. Um, are there any Boolean algebras containing F? That one, that one contains any collection of subsets you like. Okay, so the intersection, you can do the intersection, and we're fine. Okay, so, okay, so what's a sigma algebra now? Just like this, so it's a Boolean algebra 
uh, closed under countable unities. So we're also suddenly allowed to do something much more dramatic than any countable unit of sets is also in there. And by kind of similar arguments as here, um, Kent's also uh, under countable intersections. Basically because you can, you can express a countable intersection as the complement of a countable union of complements. Let me just switch back and forth to the complement so, so you get that. Uh, so, I, one reason to sort of separate out the two is that, um, so okay, so and obviously like this stuff about finer than still applies. <coughs> uh, both of these are pretty trivially sigma algebras. Um, and you can talk about generating a sigma algebra by an arbitrary collection. It's just the intersection of all sigma algebras containing it. But it's sort of, I think it's worthwhile seeing how one of the things that goes horribly wrong between the two. Um, so say F is some collection of, of uh, subsets. We can actually describe this thing quite explicitly, the Boolean algebra generated by it, but we can't do that for the sigma algebra. So what I want to do is define um, F0 just to be F, and then I'm going to inductively define Fi plus 1 to be all sets which are finite unions sets in Fi or, or the complement of such. And then the claim is actually that the Boolean algebra generated by F is just the union. those FIs, okay? So that means that any, so this is claiming in particular that anything uh, in the Boolean algebra generated by F, you can find at some point in this tower, that is you can find some value of I, so that the set you're looking at is a finite union of sets that were in Fi minus one, which is a finite union or, or complement of finite yeah. unions of sets that were in Fi minus two, all the way down to was it a finite union or, or complement of finite unions of things down in F zero. But, okay, so how, first of all, how would you prove this statement? Uh, is Fi a supposed to from the I number of unions? Uh, no, 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 it's just a finite union of sets in the previous guy. So, yeah, so this is sort of an, uh, an inductive definition. Fi plus one is defined in terms of Fi, which is defined in terms of Fi. Then, then F1, F1 is a Boolean algebra. No, no, no. no. so F1 is not a Boolean algebra, yeah. <laughs> so the problem, so can someone see why F1 is not a Boolean algebra? Well, no, so notice that actually the definition doesn't refer to intersections at all. So to check that it's a Boolean algebra, we don't have to worry about intersections at all. All we've got to do is check that it contains this. Okay, the empty set is in there. Uh, no. no, the empty yeah. set is actually in F1. Isn't F1? it complements of complements of unions? Is it complements of unions? Um, oh, no, that's unions. Yeah, that's all. Yeah, yeah. Oh. Uh, so. If I take a function set, so, so F1, first of all, uh, so let, let's sort of start, let, let's do this because it's a bit tricky. So the empty set is in, is in F1. Can someone explain why that's true? It's, it's the empty, the union of no sets at all. Great, okay, so that, that's easy. Okay, but now the, the reason why you can't just stop at F1, well, let's think, if I took some sets of this form that are finite union, that are each a finite union of sets in F0, then I can take a union of those no problem and I'm still in here. Yeah. The problem is if I take several sets from F1, which are complements of unions of things in F, there's no reason why I can take the union of those 
and write it back in this form. So I need to, I need to take finite, when I look at finite unions of these guys where I've taken one complement, that has to bump me up a level and gets me into F2, okay? So that's far from proving this claim. That just explained to us why F0 union F1 was not a Boolean algebra. We can see why you might fall out. So how would you prove something like this? Yeah, so it's pretty obvious that this contains F because F0 <coughs> is, is there. So all that we've got to do um, is, well, well, not quite. So we need to show this is a Boolean algebra. That's a first step. But that's not so bad. The idea is if you have some finite collection of sets in here, then they, because there's only finitely many of them, they only come from a finite collection of the FIs, okay? Maybe one comes from F3, one comes from 17, one comes from F a million, but there's some largest Fi that they come from. And in fact, you can easily think of them all then as sitting in F1 million. It's like everything, in, it's easy to see everyone in everything in, F0, in Fi is also in Fi plus one. So now you've just got some finite union of things in, in F uh, a million, and so that's sitting in F a million and one. So it's not so hard to show that this thing is a... Um, um, is a Boolean algebra. Okay. So what else do we need to do? If you have any other Boolean algebra. Yep. And a set in here is in that Boolean algebra. Yeah, yeah. So we, we just finally need to show that, um, that this is actually the coarsest Boolean algebra that, that, contain, that, that, uh, that contains everything in it, which I think is not so hard. You can see that anything that you built in this way had to be in any Boolean algebra containing F, because all that we did was use the operations we had to be able to do in a Boolean algebra. Okay. So here's this terrifying bit. Um, let's sort of just erase all this, which is that this exercise doesn't work for sigma algebras. And it's very sad. And in some sense, there's there's no explicit description. If I just give you a generating set and say generate the sigma algebra, there's no concrete description of what, it, what the sets in that sigma algebra look like. It's kind of bad. Uh, so what goes wrong in this argument? What? If you take the power set of the natural numbers, for instance, and then you look at the group of sets, one, two, three, and so on, and you have F being the collection sets, one, two, three, and so on. So, so just a second, so you're proposing that F uh, are these are the singleton sets? Yes. And then, uh, uh, so, and then if you inductively do that argument, uh, the finite unions of them will not have one union, uh, will not have one union, two union, three union, four union, so on. You, you know the whole integers? Yeah, sure they will. Because, because of this rule here. So we take the empty union and then take its complement yeah. and we get everything. Uh, so that, that's okay. okay. So, yeah, Let, let's at least understand, uh, so remember, uh, how did we show that this gadget was a Boolean algebra? The idea was that we said, well, if we've got, we've got two sets in, in here, okay, then one of them's in FJ and one of them's in FK, okay? We can think of the one, let, and let's just assume without loss of generality, J is less than K. We can think of the one in FJ as up in FK, and then we can stick both, we can stick their union by definition in FK plus one, right? So that sort of proves that this is closed under finite unions. As well as if we have a countable collection of sets in here. One of them might be in F1, one of them might be in F2, one of them might be in F3, and so on, and sort of, we might use unboundedly many of these FIs. And then there's no single FI that we can stick them all into. So even if we replace finite here with, with countable, there's no single FI we can stick them all into so that we can take the union of the countable union of those sets and see it in the set again. Um, did that make sense, or should I try and say it a bit more? Um, if, if you're interested, if you're either interested in this or puzzled by it, um, find Terry Tao's notes on measure theory, which I'm following pretty closely actually for, for the moment. He explains how to do a transfinite version. So here we're doing induction on the natural numbers. He explains how to do transfinite induction to give an explicit description of the sigma algebra generated by something. Um, but, uh, 
do. I think that argument works for your place that by one you mean two, you mean four, you mean eight, you mean sixteen, and so on. That set, that 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 set will be covered. If, if, if you, if, uh, I'm a little bit dubious because I'm pretty sure that to, um, that to come up, to actually explicitly write down sets that are in the, in the sigma algebra but don't come from this construction, usually you, I think it requires the axiom of choice to do. Yeah. To, so if someone wants to come up with, the, I mean, all that we explained here was we just explained why this argument wasn't going to work when we passed the sigma algebras. We didn't produce a counterexample like showing that if you replace finite with countable and then ask this question with boolean replaced with sigma or we, we don't actually have a counterexample on this but if anyone wants to come up with a counterexample write it on the discussion forum we feel one more day so, okay okay so yada 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 uh, <coughs> maybe let me skip that okay so that's great that's that's the basics of, uh, of sigma algebras. Um, maybe, oh, actually, no, let me, let me say this one more thing. So we, we're in this ghastly situation that if you have a generating set for a sigma algebra, we don't have a good description of, this, of, of an arbitrary element of a sigma algebra. But we do have the following. To say f uh, is a collection of sets, and uh, PE is a property. subsets P of X. So like here I really mean P is a function from the power set of X to true and false. Okay? It just says it either says yes or no on any given set. But such that uh, P is true on the empty set. Uh, P of E is true. P of uh, complement of E is true. And uh, if uh, we've got some EIs, and P is true on each of the EIs, then P is true on the union of the EIs. Okay? Because imagine we've got some property like that. Um, Well, maybe I should have an example for you, but let me press on for a second anyway. Then, if P is true on uh, <coughs> all E in this collection F, then P is true for all E in the sigma algebra generated by F. This is kind of like a principle of, of induction. I mean, like, how do we do induction on the natural numbers? We've got some property of natural numbers, and if it's true on n, it's automatically true on n plus one. We get to conclude it's, and it's true on zero. <laughs> then we get to conclude it's true on all the natural numbers because the natural numbers are generated by zero under taking successor. And this is exactly the same idea. And this is, even though it's very hard to get our hands on what a set in the sigma algebra generated by f looks like, this is how we prove stuff about things in the sigma algebra generated by f. We prove that this property sort of passes along on uh, these operations, and then we check it on the property of the generators. So that means that we sort of, this induction principle means we don't really need to know what elements of the sigma algebra look like. We always prove things with that technique. Okay. Um, almost time to get on to the Borel sigma algebra. So now we, we, need some, we need some examples of sigma algebras. Uh, the Borel sigma algebra is what? Any guesses? Yeah, more of an upgrade. What's that? More of an upgrade. More of an upgrade. I don't know. Yeah. It's okay. an arbitrary. If you take 
Oh no, so it's not, no, no, this isn't a special type of sigma ray algebra where even better things happen. It's, it's, it's a particular sigma ray algebra. We're now producing an example. If you take like generators of like, I don't know, oracles? Yeah, yeah. yeah, so it's exactly, it's the sigma ray algebra uh, generated by open sets in X. Okay, so let's think about what that means. Uh, Certainly, if it contains all of the open sets, it's got to contain all the closed sets because it's a sigma algebra. Um, but then we can also take, so a countable union, in fact, an arbitrary union of open sets is still open. But if you take arbitrary unions of closed sets, then you just get pretty weird. So we're going to, we certainly have sets that are neither closed nor open in there by taking weird countable unions of, of closed sets. And in general, the Borel sigma algebra is pretty hard to get your hands on. You always want to use this fact and this sort of induction idea to prove anything about it. Okay, so let's let's just have a little sort of exercise that maybe we can take the remaining five minutes to work through. So if X <coughs> is a separable metric space, so everyone's happy with what metric space is and. What do I mean by separable? Yeah, just like we would, when we were talking about open spaces, it's got some countable dense set. Uh, then the Borel sigma algebra uh, is the same as the sigma algebra generated by open balls. Here we took the sigma algebra generated by all open sets, but here I'm saying that open balls will do. Okay, so, so the question here is how do you show <coughs> that the sigma algebra generated by some collection of sets f is equal to the sigma algebra generated by some other collection of sets s prime? Okay, so here, oh. So here we're thinking like f might be all open sets and f prime is just the open balls. How do you prove something like this? Yeah, exactly. You want to show that each generator in f is actually in the sigma algebra generated by f prime and vice versa. So one direction is easy. Uh, so um, the it's obvious, I guess, that the sigma algebra generated by open sets. Contains the whole sigma algebra generated by open balls. Why is that? Open, open balls are open sets, that was easy. And how do we do it the other way around? Separability implies that they're countable. Oh, God only knows. Um, I think we can get away without using okay. second countable. We can just do it pretty directly, I think. Since every open set is a union of yeah, so how do you do that? So, so if U is open, um, take um, um, uh, so let's just say U intersect S, where S is our countable dense set. Okay, so this is now some countable set sitting inside U. Okay, uh, each X in that intersection has an open ball, B X, some radius depending on X, which is still sitting inside U because U is open. Okay, and so U is then a union over X in that set. Of those balls. Okay, certainly all of those balls are in U, so this big union is contained in U. But if you take an arbitrary point in U, what can you do? Well, oh, something's a bit crazy. Like, like a problem, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, no, it's, it's screwed up here. So what, what have I, what have I screwed up? Uh, it could be hard now, and it could be too big. 
So it's not a cardinality issue. Yeah. So, so, like so, so here, like certainly, no. this intersection here was certainly countable because it was a subset of S that was countable. Yeah. It's not a cardinality but issue. I, I felt like you wanted to take like someone in S really close, but their balls might be shrinking, like too, might be all too small. Is that right? Oh no, maybe maybe it's going to be okay. Um, yeah, so let's take some, what I was worried about is when I say take some point in U, and now I take some really close point in S, which I'm guaranteed to be able to do. I was worried that that point in S might be outside of U. But I think it's okay. I mean, I think any point in S, you can find, uh, oh, 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 no, 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 now I see the problem that you, you've hit. Um, okay. Yeah, now I'm worried about that one too. Does this work? So we take some point in, ah, uh, okay. Yeah, okay, I think, hmm. <laughs> because you say x is an element of the intersection s. Yeah, so, well, no, so we need to show, so we need to show if, uh, if y is in u, uh, there exists x in u intersection s. So uh, y is in, that ball. How do we do that? So what we will certainly, I mean, we can we can say we can find a neighborhood around y, and then that intersects the s, and we choose s from that hood, and then okay. the ball might be too little. So the ball could be too small. Yeah. yeah. Could you like construct yeah. a, a like a something that will break this? Like just choose all the RXs so they're all too small because there's a distance between X and Y. Well, no, but remember this U intersection S really is dense in U. Yeah. It's still dense in U. So you can always find such a point in, inside a neighborhood of Y. No, I don't think. I think it's a bit tricky. Um, so let, let's see. So uh, so how are we going to try and proceed here? So, okay, so we've all, at the beginning, all that we've got is y and u. Okay. And so all that we can use is, is denseness. That's all uh, we can start with. Except, but yeah, I think we can pick a neighborhood b, y, which is sitting inside the u. Okay, so we'll pick y and b, y sitting inside, inside u. And okay. mu guy must intersection intersect with s. Okay. So it must intersect with s. So there exists. Uh, some S. S Y. Yeah, inside this one. Inside B Y intersect S. Yeah, I certainly agree we can do that. Yeah, so, yeah, and then that, we, we just pick that neighborhood. No, that, that doesn't work. S Y comes with its own radius. So with S Y, when we pick these radii back over here. I do that for all of the S's inside that, uh, inside B Y. And then, uh, then you get a contradiction. What if we, yeah, what if we work out? Couldn't you say like, like a, you know, so okay, all these Rx's work, but surely in that case, then taking the Rx, Rx to be the min of Rx and the distance between x and y on two. You, you, oh, so the minimum? I yeah, mean you, yeah, so like we can shrink some of the Rx's. Okay, but x is, Because we just chose Rx so it fit inside u. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so in fact, so since since this set x that we're taking x over is is um, um, yeah is dense. I see. So you can. It's still true. Okay. So maybe that's that's going to help us. Um, um, in fact, uh, for any epsilon u is equal to the union over x of these balls around the x's with radius, the minimum of our x and epsilon. I think that's what you're saying. You can freely shrink all the balls even further, and it's still going to give you all of u. OK. Does that help? Well, I was worried, actually. Like, if epsilon is half the distance between x and y. 
I'll be I'll be in you know two minutes. But we could though. Just to work. Yeah. Uh, sorry, I didn't think about this at all beforehand. I thought it was going to be easy. Um, what else could we do? Uh, I mean, maybe we could use separability in a stronger way. So we could say that there exists actually some x n uh, in here with the distance from y to x n less than one over n, but a whole bunch of points coming in closer and closer. But the problem is these balls still might be shrinking even faster. Like these Rx's, the Rxn's might be one over two n. And even though the points are coming closer, their balls are shrinking down even faster. So I think we're, yeah. If X is in U, then, then there's a ball about X which is still in U. Yep. So, yep. Take, so take, because of separability, find someone in that ball close enough that when we do a ball half the radius inside that big ball. Of, yeah. About, because I, aren't we just trying to find a, like a ball about a, a, a person in the separable set that contains an X? We're also out of time, so we better stop. Um, but this is a this is apparently a great exercise, <laughs> um, and uh, I don't know. First person to to post an answer on Waddle, uh, you know, gets a round of applause. Looks like yours. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. Sorry, I, uh, I got confused there again. But it's certainly true. I hope it's true. Pretty sure that it's true. Um, and uh, yeah, so we'll need to talk more about real, the real sigma algebra next time, I guess.